Hello. Today, uh, Rachel Dare is joined by James Lowe to do a chat about watches. I'm delighted that James can join us in our office in Oxted today. Um, and without being a watch connoisseur myself, I'm going to ask James, who is and who's our specialist, who's out and about on the road, um, to tell us a little bit about the market and where we are currently and what's going on. However, before we do start chatting, I'm going to ask James, what's his favourite watch and why? <laughs> Um, my favourite watch, and I, I first came across it uh, probably nineteen eighties, was is a Patek Philippe Golden Ellipse. It's a standard model which they've been producing for a long, long time, and it's now pretty well the same. It's not a sports watch; it's almost a, uh, a dress watch. Very elegant lines. It's a, you even have to wind it up so so old. Um, with, it's got a very smart lapis lazuli dial. Um, don't tell my wife, but I have got a secret Patek Philippe pen, uh, fund growing very <laughs> gradually. But every time I chip some money in, the blinking Patek Philippe put their prices up, so we're not making much progress on that front. No, it's a very elegant watch. Um, uh, it's Patek Philippe's sort of starting model, really, because they have gone very blingy in, in recent times. But this one's very elegant and smart. Um, it's I think it's a mere 17 or 18 thousand pounds. So. I've got to keep working for in the foreseeable future. <laughs> but so I've, I, I haven't changed my mind. We, we see a lot of uh, all the brands in our course of our day-to-day -day work here, but I've remained faithful to my Patek Philippe, so hopefully one day it'll be on my left wrist. I always remember, James, you telling me years ago when I actually said to you, What's, um, what watch should I be looking to buy? And then you said Patek Philippe because uh, there, you said the, the watchmakers are just second to none, and uh, they were beautiful pieces. Oh. Yeah, well that's still very much the case. <laughs> so obviously we've seen the phenomenon that is Rolex, and their Submariner watch, which obviously is, is very collectible today. Uh, it's obviously has its sort of 70 year old design, uh, albeit that there's numerous updates and things like that. Um, but it's still a desirable watch. What's your thoughts on Rolex? What's your thoughts obviously on the Submariner and values? Uh, I'm not a paid up member of the Submariner fan club, but I am the exception rather than the rule. You know, they've hit it exactly right. It's any watch that's associated with scuba diving or yachting is a pretty well a guaranteed hit. All the brands have a go at it. Omega do a very good one which sells like hotcakes. Um, the Submariner has, as you said, virtually uh, unchanged over decades now. They actually brought out a, uh, a new version, which really very hard to tell the difference. Uh, September, the last September, um, it's got a very smart green dial. That's the difference, but it's got a brand new, highly developed movement, which, in fullness of time, will prove to be a success or otherwise. But y at first glance, you would not tell the difference between that watch from two months ago to one that was bought 30 years ago. Okay. The ticket price for this Submariner, the ticket price is 7950 But if you are lucky enough to have one, you could double your money on this uh, wondrous thing called the secondary watch market. They are around now in small numbers on this secondary market for between 17,000, 17, I beg your pardon, and, and 20,000. So seven nine fifty to seventeen thousand in one easy hit. Gosh, and but it's 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 the advertising. You know, they've got it dead right. It's it's a slightly sort of macho look about it, if you like. But it's a good watch. It's you know, it's built for for hardware, and um, you know it obviously w does work. And what's the waiting time if you wanted to buy one? Could you walk into the likes of watches in Switzerland? and pick up one tomorrow or? <laughs> you might have to indulge in bribery I think. <laughs> no is the answer. Um, I think the waiting list is about 18 months but you know there are all sorts of dodges and wheezes going on behind the scenes. Uh, it, uh, you know, so I think it, it can be gotten rid of but Joe Public if he walked into Watch the Switzerland would certainly have to wait at least 18 months. Right really. Wow. Yeah. So obviously we've talked about um, Petit Philippe and we've talked about Rolex 
um, there was a very large sale devoted to uh, pronounced Seiko, Psycho? Seiko. Seiko. <laughs> no, Seiko, Seiko watches. <laughs> um, many people have obviously described them as collectible watches to be investing in right now. Why has the market reacted this way? Um, what are your thoughts on these watches? On Seiko, tread with great caution. Um, Seiko introduced the quartz movement in 1968, so they've got a lot to answer for in that respect. But and, you know, they were mass producers of decent quality, mid-range price, mid-range to cheap watches. And they produced them and still produce them by the million. So there is zero um, scarcity value for 90% of what they produce. The watches that were up for sale in, uh, I think it was Hong Kong, was it? Or yes, yeah, somewhere in the Far East, uh, two or three months ago. Without exception, they were the early watches and they were, again, they were sports biased watches. The ones to avoid, in my opinion, are the ones with the digital printout, you know, like a little TV screen. Mm -hmm. The problem with those they are dead, you know, hugely accurate when they work, but when they don't work, mm -hmm. something electrical goes wrong, you're sunk. Um, I don't know of anyone that will take them on to repair them, and if they did have a go at repairing, it just wouldn't be viable economically to, to spend money repairing the watch because you certainly wouldn't get your outlay back again. But they're decent quality. Uh, you know, the movement is a standard little, little quartz, quartz tick-tock movement, probably cost about a fiver. <laughs> uh, the rest of, of the, the retail price is on presentation and smartness generally. But uh, I would be very wary about getting stuck into them in a big way. But you've got to be ultra, ultra selective because more than 90% of the, of the watches that uh, they have produced fetch 100 quid if you're lucky at auction. You know, and the ones at the stars of the show, of the, of the auction two or three months ago, were fetching two or three, four thousand pound, that sort of region. But they are you know, the, the exception rather than the rule. So I'd tread very, very carefully if you're getting stuck into Seiko's. And you've heard it here, folks, you've heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously, James, we also see a lot of pocket watches in our job when we go out to see clients. And obviously the pocket watches haven't had the same sort of um, collectible uh, mm. status. And you know, often clients are looking to dispose of them rather than collect them. But last year, there was a George Daniels Grand Complication Pocket Watch that sold for $2.5 million at auction. Yep. yep. What's the importance of George Daniels? George Daniels, um, he, when I was at Sotheby's, he was a consultant for the uh, watch and clock department there. Um, allegedly, he was a bit of a curmudgeonly old soul. <laughs> uh, he had two obsessions in life, and I mean obsessions. One were, wa were watches, and the other was vintage cars. Mm. Um, he died about f ooh, five or six years ago, and his car collection was sold by Christie's, and I think, well, certainly it was three million, it may, be, may even been four million. One Maserati fetched a couple of million on, on its own. Anyway, his other obsession was watches. His watches are, he makes everything and I mean everything in the watches he produced I think maximum 18 watches uh, his most best known one was uh, the Millennium watches which he commit which were made to, on commission uh, for the you know, 2000 uh, but this one that fetched X million pounds was a very much a one-off but he did, and I do, can't stress enough, he makes everything. He cuts out the cogwheels, he makes the springs. He even registered his um, maker's name with Goldsmith Hall because he stamped the gold cases with oh, wow. GD on, on it. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic craftsman um, and a creator, not just, he didn't, didn't just follow the plans, he, cre he drew up the plans. His big claim, or his lasting claim to fame, if you like, um, he developed a, a very high precision escapement called the coaxial. Now, if you've just bought, bought yourself uh, an Amiga, decent quality Amiga watch, that will have George Daniels' coaxial movement in it. Mm -hmm. It's just a, an extra um, precision piece of, uh, of engineering, if you like. Mm -hmm. But he, he obviously didn't <laughs> doesn't make them all for Amiga, but he designed it, patented it, and produced it for his own watches, and then on it went to Amiga. The only thing apparently he jobbed out 
when making these watches was the, the enamelling for the numbers. I don't think he actually went to shoot the crocodile to make the strap, but uh, that, the, that was the only thing that apparently he jobbed out or didn't do sitting in his little workshop in the, I think it's the Isle of Man, Isle of Wight he lives in. So these watches weren't old? No, 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 no. He died, I said, five or six years ago. Oh, wow. The earliest one, I think, came up for Sotheby's. The earliest one, he was 1995, he made. And he was only, you know, he was only making for, for actually making watches for probably about 10 years, I should think. So there's not a huge amount on the market? Ooh, no, no, no. The last Millennium watch came up, up and it made, I think, 220,000 or something. But the one you mentioned on the outset yes. was, I mean, it was a specific one-off and just hugely complicated um, and totally <laughs> impractical, really, but just a wonderful piece of machinery. Oh, wow. Okay. And again, bought by a watch collector or very much somebody that possibly... I think, obviously, someone's got a lot of money, but uh, they must have had uh, a, a, a latent interest in watches yeah. but to ap appreciate the, the, the mechanical side to it. Okay. It's and you the know, craftsmanship that went Yes, exactly, because it's a lot of money to spend on something just on, on whim. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, we see um, a huge amount of watch collections, and you know, it can range from a couple to hundreds in a client's collection. Um, do you think it's about the watch? Do you think that it's because they're easy to store, um, quite small? Obviously, there's um, a masculinity about watches, and as you said, the the manufacturers do very well in marketing these pieces. Yeah. And you know, if you can get a um, a name attached to your watch, or you know, a sportsman, etc., then again, it sort of adds. Yeah to the sort of element of the watch. But there are sort of the ultra rare and the ultra valuable and the very bespoke options that, that sort of uh, Odemars and Patek offer. But, you know, is, is, is it something that will suit every budget? You know, I mean, we talk about them being sort of over 100,000. Yeah. But why do you think these va these watches are so expensive? Is it worth the investment? And do you think that the watch sort of market will continue to grow? <laughs> I, I think mean, I think they're expensive because the watchmakers <laughs> know they can get away with it. <laughs> I mean, we know there's no capital gains on watches as well as cars. Yeah, is that an added attraction? Or I, th I th it's, it's a fact that's probably not widely known, to be honest. And it's probably just a, a nice little nice little aspect uh, that you become aware of if you do move it on if you like but I don't think it's a major s selling factor no I don't. Do you think these watches are bought to wear <coughs> or do you think they are purely uh, for an investment? I think it would be very rash to buy it purely for investment I think it's to wear and show off basically mm -hmm. you know, and you've got of course you've got to have the latest model haven't you you know you can't be dare to be seen with a five-year-old Rolex on your what on your wrist, or a, in fact, a five-year-old Cartier, should we say, on your wrist, um, and then that's where they're smart. They keep on bringing in on a regular basis every three or four years. They tweak the design a little bit, so you know the 2020 Cartier watch is going to be different from a 2016 Cartier watch, and you know th those of that ilk are going to spot the difference. So obviously, when we're valuing watches for clients, this is where that does actually have a um, effect on the value because obviously if that watch is no longer in existence it's obsolete yeah um, what do you do in those cases when you're out there valuing well you have to uh, ask the question of uh, uh, to the owner do you if perish the thought that your watch collection or that watch goes missing for whatever reason would you go and buy a, a replacement and does your insurer offer you what they call new for old or second-hand replacement? Because the difference in price is ginormous. Just get back to Cartier, if you like. A, a standard gold Pantera bracelet watch is retails for getting mid-20s now, 24, 25,000. That watch, albeit five years old, comes up for auction and you can get one perfectly presentable, barely discernible from the mod brand new one, for three, four, five thousand pounds. So that's the gap. It's 
it's it's a quarter of the price or a third of the price so you've got to ascertain on what basis the insured your client wishes to insure because obviously if you are insuring it for a retail replacement um, of the watch that's no longer obsolete so you're looking at the new model that's coming out yeah. but again does that uh, will that have an effect on if that watch isn't actually available for X amount of years it might do yes it might do um, the the stumbling block comes really when okay Cartier produce a wide range of, 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 of models but if you come ac across a watch which is no longer produced then it has only got a second-hand replacement value and if you go on any of these uh, portals on, on online you know there are millions of in Vodacom second-hand watches available and you know, name your brand I'm sure you can find it there but that is very much a basic second-hand replacement uh, basis so where over say the last five years have we seen the biggest increase in replacement prices for watches? They've all gently trotted up, but it's the secondary market that, that has rather sort of shaken things up. Uh, uh, but I can't stress enough how limited this, how, how few brands and models the secondary market applies to. 90, again, 90% of watches that you buy from wherever, watch of Switzerland or any, um, any decent retailer, as soon as you leave the shop, you know, you've done your dough. <laughs> the, the value has dropped enormously. It's only a very few brands and models that you're going to stand a chance of making any money out of, long term anyway. So obviously with us going out to clients, how often would you recommend somebody's actually looking at their valuation? And, well, and does it have an effect if they are actually a collector or just um, you know, somebody that, that has a watch and it was purchased because they wanted a watch? No, I don't think it does. You know, um, a collector will buy a specific, he, you know, he, he, sets his, uh, uh, he sets his hopes on a specific model and, and a brand and, and a specific model and he'll go and get it for his collection. We see collections of <coughs> totally you know, widespread, not just sports watches, not just military watches, what have you, across the whole gamut. And they people go for tricky, tricky movements like tourbillons and things like that and ones that chime, etc, etc. It's quite a collective. I, I don't think we ought to stress too much the collector's market. I think uh, whether collectors is the right word, uh, um, hoarders I think really. Pe <laughs> people buy them, as I said, to wear occasionally and show off. I think that's the summary I'm afraid. And there are very few people that actually buy them for what they are, i.e. wonderful bits of machinery. Because obviously when you go to events, which I know is uh, not a thing we're doing at the moment, yeah. but often when you go you will see jewellers and watchmakers that will take stands. Certainly at a lot of the car events you'll find that yeah, the, the yeah. watch um, companies turn up to sell because they sort of go hand in hand. It, um, yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a noticeable fact recently that they seem to be te teamed together, very much so. A good thing or a bad thing? Can't do any harm, can it? Because <laughs> <laughs> it makes you want to go out and buy a new car as well. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously when we're going out to clients and I mean part of our role of valuers is sort of sharing our knowledge with our clients and with brokers so that they understand the importance of having a valuation mm. because it's very difficult certainly for diamonds to value something when you can't actually see it or there is no certificate because it's been stolen but obviously for watches it's probably a little bit easier because you know if you've got a photograph of a watch yeah and 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 you know, the the good the big brands should we say have all got specific reference numbers so all you've got to say to someone who's up to speed on watches is uh, protect Philippe reference 5610p oh yes i know the one you know it's as straightforward as that so if we've got a decent photograph or a decent reference number, we're nearly there. And we can provide a value. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. How important is the box and the certificate and the, all the registration details for a watch? It's very helpful, very helpful. Um, 
you know, there are fakes, ginormous amount of fakes around. Um, Rolex started the ball rolling about 40 or 50 years ago. The cheap Rolex is made in China. Um, you know, there's no, not one Italian waiter in London that didn't have a fake <laughs> Rolex on. <laughs> and it's sort of what you put, a, put on the table and you sneeze and it blows away. But then, you know, the, the real one weighs a ton. But um, yes, it is uh, very important now, especially if, if you had in mind possibly selling it and, and upgrading or doing something with it. It's very important these days. Um, certificate box is nice, but it's not as nearly as important as a certificate um, with stating serial numbers and reference number, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and because that, that'll date it exactly. So, when you do come across a fake, are they easy to spot? Oh, terribly hard, terribly <laughs> hard. <laughs> um, they're getting jolly hard. I, I, I Rolex is a fairly straightforward because um, they have got a specific weight and uh, steel and gold Rolex date just gentleman's watch weighs a, a specific number of grams okay. and you can gen you can generally tell it's the quality okay first glance the dials look dial looks pretty good fine no trouble at all but you just feel the 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 gauge and the and the quality of the bracelet that's that's perhaps a, more of a giveaway than the actual movement itself or the uh, or the um, the dial but it's the quality of the of the metal work really that's uh, the, the real giveaway um, yeah Rolex they have been fiddled about with the donkey's years. Patek, the, we do see a few Patek fakes around, but thankfully few and far between. And in theory, they're worth nothing. But you know, if you go to um, Mumbai, you can get yourself a very convincing <laughs> Patek <laughs> for, leave for, for for 15 quid. <laughs> Actually, talking about other countries, I always sort of remember that you know people would go abroad to buy uh, watches and, and, and jewellery because they either felt that they were getting a, a better deal than what they could in the UK. Is there a standard price around the world or does does that differ? They used to be and I say used to be. Patek obviously make uh, they, everything's costed out in Swiss francs and the Swiss franc varied in, in value against the dollar as opposed to the euro as opposed to the rupee or what have you, what have you. Yes, so gains could be made by keeping keeping sharp as to currency fluctuations. You might be able to pay for your trip to America if you go out across there and, and buy a Patek at their retail price. Up until recently, Rolex, um, if you were a, a Rolex franchise dealer retailing their new watches and you were seen to be discounting, you were cut off the list. Uh. But that's all gone by the board because everyone haggles now everyone haggles and I don't think you do much business really if you don't do a deal oh, I'm not saying it's a generous deal but and I'm sure some of their profit markup is to take into consideration the fact that it might be going to be knocked down a little bit so you shouldn't pay the price that's on the ticket it's worth a try <laughs> it's worth a try <laughs> whether you get away with it or not well, i used to work for uh, the crown jewelers at garrards and they were they were retailers for rolex and i keep on telling this story to clients that had i don't know 25 years ago you walked past the uh, garrards front window and said well that's a nice rolex i'll go and have a look ticket price eighteen thousand five hundred, and you go up to the salesman and said Right, I'll give you fifteen thousand pounds. They'd have called the police pretty well. No. <laughs> oh, they didn't like it. But I'm talking, you know, twenty-five years ago. Right, so. Okay. But I think um, you know, to do business, you've got to do a bit, a bit of a deal, even on the Rolex and Patek front. So, what have you seen that has amazed you when you've been out on your valuations? I mean, is there anything that you? Are we talk about just watches. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've seen some. Fantastic tourbillon watches. Now tourbillon is a, a really tricky little extra um, improvement, if you like, or, or to, to, the, to the movement, to the, to the escapement, to the escapement. It just makes it ultra, ultra, ultra uh, accurate, and it doesn't. It's not affected by the angle of the watch or sudden movement of the watch, which some, can sometimes, if it's certainly if it's an automatic, can upset the timekeeping a little bit. But to look at the, uh, I, I went to. There was a uh, masterpiece. You may have heard of the masterpiece e exhibition a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Yeah. There was um, Audemars Piguet had a stand there, and there was some chap there, watchmaker, sitting at the stand, and he was 
taking apart and reassembling a very complicated Audemars Piguet watch before your very eyes. Oh. And he got the basics, he got the case apart, he got the movement out, and, and it was all arrayed, arranged in front of him on the table. And I think dis dissembling a watch took him about half an hour. Just amazing thing to watch. Gosh, and you know, we're not talking about straightforward little quartz movement, we are talking about a high, high spec quality movement. So they are, you know, good watches are fantastic works of art, they really are. And I know some, some are eye-wateringly expensive, but you've got to factor in man hours spent, um, and, you know, uh, yeah. They are expensive, but in most cases they're worth it. Most cases, I say. So, money, no object. We've talked about what you would like to buy yeah. at the start of this. So, money, <coughs> no object. Uh, what would you buy? I would steer, well this is just personal taste and this is not, I would steer clear of, uh, of a, a, a gem covered, colour, uh, covered one, um, you know you're paying a ginormous amount of money for the gems and the poor chap that has to set all the stones. <laughs> um, I would go for, what would I go for? I would go for a, a sporty tourbillon watch made by Patek Philippe, I think. Okay, yeah, so still I think. with Patek. Yeah, okay. yeah. But I, I'll I'll make do with my gold in the lip just for the time <laughs> being. But I'll aspire to a sporty tourbillon from Patek. Uh, but it might, might take a few more years of saving up, I'm afraid. <clears throat> James, thank you so much Pleasure. for today. But um, don't just uh, don't. Uh, what I my mantra is: buy a watch because you like it. Buy a watch because you're, you're going to wear it and enjoy it. If by some fluke you make a profit, all well and good, but don't set out with an idea of buying a watch to make a profit because you might end up in tears. Very good advice. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Pleasure. James. I know this has been um, a long time coming, but it's lovely to have you here. <laughs> cheers. And uh, great to share your knowledge as always. Wunderbar. Thank so you. Cheers, cheers. From Rachel Dare, uh, sitting at our office as we are out and about now, uh, in Oxted, our valuers are happily out doing valuations. Um, I just want to say thank you, and uh, as we're coming up to Christmas, wish everybody uh, season's greetings. Thanks very much. Bye bye. <laughs>